All right, so we've talked about um, the MOSFET extensively. And we, the way we modeled the MOSFET, we saw that it's basically the operation, the entire operation of the MOSFET was based on the inversion charge that you form in the channel. So you have a channel, you create an inversion charge, which basically another way of thinking about it is that you're lowering the potential barrier. Uh, because you have, if you think about it across the channel itself, right? If you think about an NMOS or the PMOS is the same way, everything just like reversed. If you think about the classical picture of a MOSFET, what you have here, you have two back-to-back -back diodes. So you have a PN junction here and a PN junction here. So you have two back-to-back -back diodes that normally will not pass any current. So it will not be passing a lot of current from here. And what you're doing in practice is that, so, so normally before you apply the gate voltage, you have a potential barrier like this. And then when you apply a positive gate voltage, um, what happens is that effectively, because these are the energy levels for the electrons, you're pushing these down. Therefore, you're lowering the potential barrier. So you make it to a place where basically uh, you have much, a lot, large number of carriers that can go from each side to the other side. So you form a channel that can conduct current. And then now if you apply an electric potential across the channel, you're moving this down. So basically, the electrons can start flowing from the source to the drain. So that's the basic picture. Now, the way we wrote the inversion charge initially was that we read, said that Q inversion the charge density was essentially um, C ox times VGS minus VT, meaning that above and, and this is valid, of course, only above VT, which for VGS greater than VT. And the implicit assumption here was that if you look at this equation, it goes to zero at VGS equals VT, which basically assumes that there is no charge on the surface at that point. But now if you look at the energy band diagram, so, we, so this, the, the energy band diagram we drew here is across here, right? Across the channel in this direction. Now, if you start looking at the energy band diagram across this dimension, which is what we did originally, we did it for PMOS, so we can actually now see how it looks like for NMOS. What you see is this, like this. So, so let's say you have an N-type material, right, initially. Let's say it, when you're flat band. So when you're flat band, and then this N-type material has some EI, okay, where is the Fermi level, if it's an N-type material, above or below EI? So where would my Fermi level be, here or there, if it's n-type? It's above. But is this n-type? This is actually p-type, right? The bulk is p-type, right? So it should be below. I mean, I asked the wrong question. So, and you answered the wrong question correctly. So, so anyway, so this is p-type. So the Fermi level is going to be here, right, initially. Somewhere, somewhere below the EI, right? So, somewhere, doesn't matter. Depending on how p-type it is, how, how deeply, uh, how, much, how, many, how much concentration of the charge carriers you have. So now, and then you have, let's say it's, you have the flat band condition initially. So let's say you have, the, this is your insulator, your oxide going across here. And then you have your metal, where an energy level would be here, the gate. Now, if I'm applying a positive voltage to the gate, what is, what is it going to do? Applying a positive voltage to the gate, this handle, if you think about it, is going to push it up or down? It's going to push it down, right? Because this is a positive voltage on energy level. So it's going to push it down. And, and that, what is that going to do? It's going to bend. Some of the field will fall across the oxide. So this will be bent. And some of the field will, be, will form a depletion region, so some of the field will fall across here. So, if you think about that, so then, then we, if you redraw this picture, we'll have a situation like this. So there's your energy band bending. Uh, the band gap is not really increasing, so yes, anyway, or decreasing. And then there would be a drop across here. So, and the vacuum energy, of course, would be continuous if there are no surface charges or anything like that. So that would be, this would be the work function of the metal. This is the electron affinity of the surface. So what you can see is that this is, again, inversion, right? 
you can see inversion here. And you can see that at some point, you have, now here at the surface, you have more, you look more like an n-type because your Fermi energy is closer to the conduction band. It's above the EI, right? It's below the valence. I mean, it's above EI, where it was, whereas it was below EI in the bulk. So the key question is, what is happening in terms of, um, so, so and then you're, this is actually pushed down. So this is going to be a little bit farther down. This is the metal EF. Um, so the key question is, now, is there any charge density at the surface? And we know it, there is, right? So if I ask you, what is the charge density? Let's say we are not at the point where this is the same as that. So, so basically, we are sub-threshold. Because we def you remember, we defined the strong inversion as when the surface becomes as much, in this case, n-type as the bulk is p-type. Or you have the same carrier concentration of the opposite type. And therefore, this phi f has to be, had to be equal to this phi f. So let's say we are not at that point. We had a general expression for the gate voltage relationship to the surface potential. We said the surface potential phi s was related to the gate voltage, VGS in general. Um, so it would be phi s, right, plus uh, gamma. So we had the phi s plus gamma square root of phi s, right? And then we said if it is phi s is 2 phi f, then we plug it in so we got that initial VT0 prime, and then we had the add to flat band, et cetera, et cetera, condition. But so, so that's what it is. Now, the other question is, what is the carrier concentration in general on this, at the surface at this point in the channel? So that carrier concentration, we have an expression for it, right? We know that N is Ni E to the EF minus EI over KT, right? So that's the, character, that's the density of the inversion charge, because it's going to be n-type, right? So that's the density. So the question is, can I come up with an expression for this based on these two? So what I know, what, what do we know about the EF and EI about on the surface? Well, what do we know about the EI on the surface? You know that the EI is related on the surface to the phi s, right? Because the energy level, one is potential, one is energy level, right? So there would be a dependence. So if you didn't have this term at all, let's for a second assume that you didn't have this term, then would you, would you agree that n would be proportional to e to the power of um, q phi s, because you have to convert it to energy from the electric potential. So you have to multiply this by q, divided by kt. In which, we, well, it, so it would be proportional to that anyway. So, sorry, it, it is proportional to that. But, and, and then if this term didn't exist, then it would be proportional to QVGS over KT. If this term did not exist. Right? Now that this term exists, the easiest way to deal with it, again, uh, is just add a constant here in the exponential. Because it's a linear plus a sublinear. So you can actually think about it as some sort of an additional constant. So it makes it a little bit weaker dependence. So you have some, some n, which is greater than 1, some constant. Therefore, if your carrier concentration is proportional to that, then you can expect your current to be proportional to that. So for a given drain source voltage, now you can see that you have a carrier concentration that's non-zero, unlike this picture. And what that means is that now you have a situation where you, ha you can expect to have a drain current that would be proportional to the E to the Q VGS over K, uh, NKT. It would also depend on the VDS, because you're applying a voltage. The more voltage you apply across this thing, the more charge can go. But you can see now it's an exponential dependence. Now it's actually carrier the energy dependent, how many of them are available to cross, because the barrier is not lower too much or sufficiently, let's put it. The barrier is not lowered sufficiently. So now this should remind you of some behavior of some another device. This looks more like a BJT, right? And in subcarrier, actually MOSFETs, in sub-threshold, -sub in sub-threshold, MOSFETs do behave more like a BJT in terms of their dependence on the VGS. There's a dependence on VDS as well. So but this is the key point. 
that if I want to think about the dependence of the current versus VGS in subthreshold, you really are looking at an exponential. And this is what we need to know. So it's not a quadratic anymore. It's an exponential for, for subthreshold when you're below threshold. So we, now we understand that there is some inversion charge and there is some current. And we'll see when we design circuits that this impact, in fact, has an impact on the maximum achievable gain that you can get out of a MOSFET. And one of the things that you see is that if you don't take this into account, at some point you will get unrealistic values for what is the best gain that you can achieve from a CMOS or MOS amplifier um, without taking this into account. So we'll come back to this at some point. All right? Any questions on that? Okay, very good.